The following podcast is not meant for children or for liberals, even though that's pretty much the same thing these days, but that's what we're here for. Somebody's got to keep these brats in line. Anyway, you've been warned. It's the right opinion. These days, our media is either incompetent or malevolent. They don't believe in heaven, but they acting like they haven't sent. Knowing the truth is way harder than telling it. We gotta work harder, gotta be more intelligent. Sometimes we just gotta grab a mic and start yelling shit. We're living in times when it's hard to stay relevant. Be the elephant in the room in a room full of elephants. Be the elephant in the room in a room full of elephants. Boom. Which is just hilariously also the same sound that Qasem Soleimani heard right before he was removed from the face of the earth by a U.S. airstrike in Iraq. That's going to be the subject of this week's edition, a bonus edition at that, of the Right Opinion Podcast. Now, you know I'm serious for a couple of reasons. A, I'm set to do my monthly show on the Sunday uh, coming up on January 5th, and that'll be out to you fine folks When I get it all recorded, when I sit down on Sunday, as soon as I'm done, I will upload it for your oral pleasure, A-U-R-A-L. Don't get any ideas anyway. So I'm serious. I'm jumping into this because, frankly, the news cycle is just ridiculous. It's hard to keep up with. People on social media have lost their goddamn minds. They, They assume that we're all jumping into World War III, that this was some sort of crazy, unprecedented, ridiculous act by our president when, in fact, it was nothing short of pure, unadulterated foreign policy brilliance by the president. Now, where will this ultimately lead? I don't know. But as of right now, the earth is rid of one disgusting son of a bitch who is responsible for the deaths and the harm of hundreds, if not thousands of Americans, as well as people all around the world. The earth is better off and safer today because of the actions taken by the Trump administration. And instead of thanking him for it, Everybody wants to uh, to try to get him out of office because, well, that's what they've been doing for the last three years. So why stop now? Anyway, you know, also know I'm serious because you can hear that. That's right. I went to paper notes because I sat around all day at the office and I was determined to crank out at least a short episode for you on this on this situation because everybody's talking about it. It's the big hot button topic. And frankly, I didn't want it to eat into all of the other work that I had already done for my show on Sunday. So. Trump's Benghazi, and whether or not the New York Times is in bed with Iran, and then we're going to get to Rose McGowan in the hashtag Dear Iran nonsense at the tail end here. But this is a podcast about politics. I like to try to open with facts, hit you with opinions, and then close out with a little something entertaining or at least some form of those three, but that's pretty much how it's going to shake out this time around. If you aren't already doing so, please make sure that you're subscribed to therightopinion.podbean.com. You can find us on iTunes and Google Play as well. Just search The Right Opinion. It's the little black-white. It's the uh, it's the logo that is black, white, and red all over, and hopefully listened all over as well, although the numbers aren't necessarily indicating that yet. That's where I need your help. So if you are already subscribed, do me a solid and share this episode on your social media. Get the word out. Put some uh, frilly hashtags on there to get some attention. If you don't have a ton of followers, anything that you were willing to do to try to spread the word of the right opinion, your boy Harrison much appreciates it. Anyway, so let's dive into some of the facts here. Uh, Oh, you know what? Real quick. Also, hackerhameen.podbean.com. And Rat Salad Review are now also carrying this podcast on a couple of days delay. They will not be getting this one because it's a bonus episode, but if you wanted my monthly episodes, I will put them up over there in addition to the therightopinion.podbean.com. Expanding my horizons a little bit, I do want to give a thank you to Wayne Noon of the Rat Salad Review. He's been a longtime supporter of mine and of this show. And, uh, and even of a lot of the stuff going on over at hackerhameen.podbean.com. He was a sponsor, or they, Rat Salad Review, were a sponsor of ours over there. Wayne needed a new show for his platform. He reached out to yours truly, and Wayne, you are more than happy, more than welcome, I should say. I'm more than happy. You're more than welcome to have my content. Frankly, folks, if you have a podcast feed out there and you're looking to provide some additional content, you are welcome to mine. Uh, just, you know, hit a brother up first so I know where I could send people to go find it. Uh, you can email the show, the right opinion pod at gmail.com, or just find me on Twitter at right opinion pod, and for that matter, on Instagram at 
Right Opinion Pod. Uh, this show is not about me making myself famous or trying to get all the glory or uh, making, uh, making a living off of it. This is very much about me having beliefs that I feel are being woefully underrepresented in the media. And so, who better to get them out there than me? Because who knows my beliefs better than I? So that's what this show is really all about. And providing you with facts that you're not otherwise being exposed to by the mainstream media, by probably even some of your less mainstream media, depending on which way you lean or, I guess, which way they lean politically. But let's dive into uh, the events of, quote-unquote, Trump's Benghazi, uh, which is hilarious, right? Because the media had bent over backwards for years to tell us that, like, nothing, you know, Benghazi wasn't that big a deal. I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, yeah, a few people died, but, like, it could have, it couldn't have really been prevented, and it was that nasty internet video, and yada, yada, yada. And then all of a sudden, there's a similar situation in the Middle East, this time in Iraq, and Trump is, has this on his plate. How's he going to deal with it? This is going to be Trump's Benghazi. Well, I'm sorry, I thought you we're just bending over backwards for the last, I don't know, several years trying to tell us that Benghazi was no big deal, that there's nothing, no, no dark mark on the Obama administration or the Clinton State Department because Benghazi was just like everything was done above board, guys, nothing to worry about, just a few people died, no biggie. Well, Barack Obama is not in charge anymore, nor is Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump is, and uh, look, guys, I mean, there's, there's really no way of saying this any other way than I'm about to say it. Don't fuck with Donald Trump, okay? Literally everybody who's ever messed with this guy in recent history has ended up falling flat on their face. Many of them ended up in, you know, with consequences far less, let's say, permanent than those of Qasem Soleimani. But um, Donald Trump's not messing around, guys. And more importantly, everybody's pushing this World War III narrative and Trump wants to go to war. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get on here. But look, Donald Trump does not want to go to war. He has had more than enough opportunity to do so and has turned away from it at every given chance. He actually had a chance to start a war with Iran, the country that they're assuming that he's going to try and start a war with now, months ago when they shot down one of our drones and were blocking off the Strait of Hormuz and targeting ships not only of ours but of other uh, allies of ours in, in Europe. He could have started a war when there were supposedly chemical attacks being implemented in Syria. He didn't continue to, uh, you know, he didn't send in a variety more troops. He didn't start a full-scale ground war. Granted, we had some troops in the area already. And for that matter, he's, he's actually pulled some of them out, even though they're doing everything they can to try to get him to put them back in, including just conspicuously ISIS prisoners just poof. Oh, I don't know how they got past this, guys. Like, now they're out in the open. And uh, they're using that as bait to try to get the U.S. back involved in Syria. But Trump has had every opportunity. To, uh, to start a full-scale war. He has not. That said, he's clearly not afraid to implement some military action, some quick and decisive, and for that matter, short-term military action. Because, look, what are threats if you're not willing to back them up? Every so often, people need to be put in check, including terrorists like Qasem Soleimani, who will luckily no longer be a problem for us. But I've, I've teased this too long. I think I've plugged everything I need to plug I'm ready to dive into some facts. So let's open up here. This is a, a little timeline from Time Magazine. I clipped out some sections of it to kind of give you an overview of what exactly happened here. And I know you guys are like, Time Magazine, look, I did cross-reference some of these. It looks like this is a pretty neat and concise uh, way of breaking down the events here, although Time Magazine does try to get their little editorializations in there, and I obviously clip them out because I am not an idiot. So let's get into this timeline. Friday. December 27th, not that long ago, a U.S. defense contractor killed in rocket attack in Iraq. A U.S. defense contractor was killed in an attack on an Iraqi military compound near Kirkuk, Iraq, according to the Associated Press. The attack also injured four U.S. service members and two Iraqi security forces members, according to the Department of Defense. As many as 30 rockets were fired in the attack. The U.S. blamed the Iranian-backed militia for the assault. On Monday... The group denied responsibility for the December 27th attack through a spokesperson, according to the New York Times, because, and this is now me and not the uh, Time Magazine article, because, of course, their spokesperson ran to the New York Times. More on that to come 
at the tail end of this segment here. But um, moving back into the article here, several other similar attacks have occurred over the past few months. So this is not an isolated incident. It wasn't the, this wasn't an overreach. This wasn't um, a, a, a desperation move. This was something that's been going on for a while. I, I think there's plenty of places across the world that are trying to go Donald Trump into war, whether or not it's a good thing for them long term. I don't know that they're all that interested in that because unlike, well, previous presidents would start a big time war in one of these countries to try to change the regime there. The people who would suffer the most would be the average everyday citizens who have very little to do with what their ruling class is ultimately deciding um, in, in some of these actions here. And they get to just sit in their palaces until maybe one day the U.S. troops come knocking on their door. And if and when that happens, I mean, we all know how it ends. But frankly, with a lot of these guys, it's going to end that way one way or another. But um, it's, it's very strange the amount of people that want to tempt the U.S. military. I think if, if there's one thing our government does better than anyone has ever done it ever, it's put together a military. And uh, our military is not to be you know trifled with. And again, Qasem Soleimani learned that one the hard way. Moving on to Sunday, December 29th, U.S. airstrikes uh, kill 25 military members. The U.S. conducts airstrikes on five sites of uh, Kateb Hezbollah and Iranian-backed militia, according to the Department of Defense. The U.S. indicated that the strikes were in retaliation to the rocket attacks from two days prior, and the attack killed 25 fighters, according to the Associated Press. Okay. That's a, a little background there for you. Then we get into where it starts to get really interesting. On Tuesday, December 31st, New Year's Eve, protesters break into the U.S. Embassy compound. After a funeral for fighters killed in the airstrikes from two days prior, protesters broke into the U.S. Embassy compound in Baghdad. This is all happening in Iraq, by the way. Everybody's talking about Iran, uh, Iran because that's the guy that we killed was a general from from Iran, Iran, whatever you want to call it. It's frankly irrelevant. They're not worthy of enough respect for you to pronounce the name of their country properly. But um, Iran, Iran, whatever it is, that the general was from there, but he was killed in Baghdad, by the way, largely with the permission of the Iraqi government, who was working with us as a joint special task force, basically out there trying to quell some of this terrorist activity that's going on in the area. Back to the article. Protesters gathered outside the compound shouting death to America and death to Israel. These folks seem like they'd be fun at parties and started to throw water and stones over its walls. They smashed through a door, set a reception area on fire, and covered the embassy wall with militia flags and anti-U.S. graffiti. They also planted flags above the reception area. According to the Associated Press, many were wearing militia uniforms, once again according to the AP. Uh, the Iraqi security forces didn't try to stop the protesters, permitting them to pass a security checkpoint, according to the AP. So AP is all over this, but Trump more over, all over it, right? So Trump responds to all of this. Mind you, this is uh, it's it is Benghazi up to this point, right? It's all, all of the signs are there. We have militants who want to kill our you know citizens on the walls of our embassy whether it's Libya, Iraq, Iran, fucking Germany, I don't care who it is, where it is, or why it is, if any of this is ever going down, it requires swift and decisive action, which is precisely what the President of the United States provided. He gets onto Twitter and he says, Iran killed an American contractor, wounding many. We strongly responded and always will. Now Iran is orchestrating an attack on the U.S. Embassy in Iraq. They will be held fully responsible. In addition, we expect Iraq to use its forces to protect the embassy, and so notified, end quote. So that's the Donald taking swift and decisive action. He also sent some military into the area, sent about 100 Marines and a few Apache helicopters in there. That brings us to Wednesday, January 1st, 2020. U.S. troops used tear gas and protesters called off. The protest uh, picked up again on Wednesday as demonstrators started a fire on the roof of the reception area, this prompted U.S. troops to fire tear gas at the crowd, according to the Associated Press and other outlets. Iraqi fe federal police, counterterrorism forces, and soldiers lined up in between the protesters and the compound. There were no reports of conflict between Iraqi officials and the protesters. So Trump said, hey, you guys just let these guys walk by you, talking to the Iraqis this time. You guys just let these protesters walk right by you through the security check into our embassy. That ain't gonna fly, pal. And literally the next day, the Iraqi federal police, counterterrorism forces, and soldiers are lined up between the protesters 
and the compound. Now, granted, some of the protesters were already in the compound, but at least the Iraqi special forces here got off their ass and uh, decided to actually do their jobs. That moves us forward to a couple days later, Friday, January 3rd, where Iran's General Qasem Soleimani is assassinated by a U.S. airstrike. In a sharp escalation of the proxy attacks between the U.S. and Iran, Iranian General Qasem Soleimani, the powerful head of Iran's Quds Force of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, was assassinated by a U.S. airstrike early Friday morning, the Department of Defense confirmed in a statement. Soleimani was killed near Baghdad's international airport. Several officials from uh, Iranian-backed Iraqi militias were also killed, according to the New York Times. And then here's their statement, which is really mostly them quoting the Department of Defense. So I don't know why this is necessarily according to the New York Times, but that's how uh, Time Magazine wanted to write it. So here we are. Uh, The quote from the New York Times, General Soleimani was actively developing plans to attack American diplomats and service members in Iraq and throughout the region, the Department of Defense said in a statement. General Soleimani and his Quds forces were responsible for deaths for the deaths of hundreds of Americans and coalition service members and the wounding of thousands more. The statement adds that Soleimani was behind the attacks on the U.S. coalition bases. It says biases here. The fucking New York Times can't even... <laughs> the New York Times has a bias even when they're trying to just write the word bases. Anyway, uh... Back to uh, the New York Times article here. The statement adds that Soleimani was behind attacks on U.S. coalition bases in Iraq for the past months and approved the storming of the U.S. embassy, which is precisely what we're all talking about here today because he wasn't able to really fully storm the U.S. embassy the way that he wanted to, right? They tried. They got in the door. um, You know, they took over the reception area. Ooh, big, scary Iranian militia folks over there. Um, And ultimately, Donald Trump acted swiftly acted decisively, acted powerfully, and Soleimani's no longer a problem. Poof, gone, just like that. So those those are the events of what took place in Baghdad. Uh, Trump you know, basically told them, back off, and they didn't. And so someone had to die. And the media were painting this all, like I mentioned before, as Trump's Benghazi, which is hilarious because there, there was nothing wrong with Benghazi, according to uh, the media prior to all of this. Um, This was not Benghazi because this time it was actually handled appropriately. If you mess with our embassies or our citizens or our sovereignty, you die, plain and simple. And rather than, you know, start a full scale war and harm the citizens of the country that have absolutely nothing to do or very little to do with the decisions that are made by the ruling class, Trump goes after the ruling class directly with a hypersonic missile at that. And Trump has been very clear throughout his campaign and throughout his presidency, not only through his words, but through his actions, that he is not about starting wars. He doesn't want to start any wars. He wants to end wars. Up until a couple weeks ago, it looked like we were down a war as he was trying to get troops out of Syria, which unfortunately hasn't gone as smoothly as one would imagine. But at a certain point, you do have to just cut bait and get the hell out, or for that matter, just completely take over. Now, I'm much more in favor of the first one, because I don't like these long, never-ending regime change wars, which never seem to end well, and the regime that ends up in place seems to always be just as corrupt as the one that was there before, and we waste trillions of dollars in lives along the way. Not that the dollars are more important than the lives, it's just the order in which it came out of my mouth. Please, don't read too much into that. Um, Now, there's no actual rational explanation as to why Trump would want to start a war in an election year, despite the fact that I guess Trump had tweeted several times during the Obama presidency, during the first term of the Obama presidency, that Obama would start a war with Iran to somehow guarantee his re-election. Now, much like Obama, Trump is heading into his re-election bid with little to no evidence that he's going to need any help. So as, uh, as ludicrous as those tweets may have been, uh, almost, I guess, eight to six years ago, from what I saw from my, my mental recollection of the timestamps on them, um, Trump was, you know, he was a loud mouth on Twitter. Nothing has changed since then. But um, (laughs) Trump, a loudmouth on Twitter? Nah, Harrison, you're crazy, man. No, I'm kidding. Obviously, the guy, look, the guy lives in hyperbole, okay? Is he wrong about some stuff? Sure. Is he, does he occasionally bend the truth about some stuff? Sure. It's called playing the game, folks. No politician has ever gotten to where he got, other than maybe George Washington, without 
telling a few lies, bending a few truths, living in some hyperbole. Every presidential campaign is, you know, um, some fine print away from being a used car sales uh, commercial, basically. Uh, it's, I'm going to give you this, I could give you that, we could do this, and it's not going to cost you any more money. We all know that's not true, and yet they continue to go out there and say it. For some reason, Donald Trump is the first politician in the history of the world to be held to his standards uh, that he laid out for himself in the campaign, which is even more hilarious, being that he's actually one of the few who's lived up to the standards that he laid out in his campaign, as I'm going to be talking about on Sunday when I get into Trump um, achievements, which there are a lot of, and why I'm doing this episode, because I didn't want this story to chew into that story in any way, shape, or form. So keep an eye out for that, therightopinion.podbean.com. Anyway, back into all this here. So Trump doesn't want to go to war. There's no logical reason to suggest that he would want to go into a war. Nothing about his rhetoric or his actions have expressed or shown in any way, shape, or form that the guy wants to put tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of troops on the ground in a country and try to take over the regime. There's been not a sniff of that happening since the man has started talking about politics in the political since he's entered the political realm about five years ago. Now at this point, it's not happening. It ain't gonna happen, and and certainly not gonna happen if Trump has anything to say about it. Now that said, should there be a, a big attack or maybe uh, other members of the coalition in the area want to move into Iran or something along those lines, you know, circumstances change. You never go into war alone, you never go into war for long, and you never go into war unless you absolutely have to. I think that's Fox Connors. Um, or, you know, more more relatable for all of you fine folks is is uh, Odin of uh, of Asgard from the MCU movies. Uh, what's his face? The, the actor. God damn it. How am I forgetting that? Fucking Hannibal. What's his name? Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins plays Thor. He uh, plays Odin. He always used to tell his son Thor that a great king must never, you know, run into war, but must always be prepared for it. And unfortunately, you know, when you have the biggest, baddest military in the world, you kind of always need to be ready for you. And it's also the same thing when you're the biggest, best country in the world. You kind of always got to be worried about somebody trying to nip at your heels. And a good buddy of mine lives in New York, sees an article today. He's kind of panicking about it because de Blasio hit some panic button, freaked out and told law enforcement, like, we could be under attack. That was a panic move to try to scare people. I'm positive of it because de Blasio is just a fucking idiot. I mean, there's there's no two ways about it. The guy's a moron. Um, But uh, and he obviously doesn't like Trump. So he was going to do everything he could within his power to, 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 you know, spread the smear tactics of the media and of his buddies on the left. Um, But like, look, you live in New York, not not to my friend specifically, but anybody lives in New York. You live in the biggest, best city in the history of the world. Of course you were perpetually in more danger than, you know, some guy out in bumfuck Idaho. If it bothers you all that much, move. I don't, I'm not telling you you need to, it's not a love it or leave it situation. I'm saying that instead of telling me or telling people on Twitter how terrified you are, move. Because unless you're moving, I don't know how scared you actually are. And it's okay to be scared. You live again. You live in a country. You live in a country that is a massive target for the world. In a city that is a massive target for the world. And the people out there that are, you know, Trump did this, and now we have to worry about the the late. You know, we have to worry about the lashback from the Iranians. Do you not punish your kids because you're afraid that they might lash out at you? And it's unfortunate that we kind of play that role. I don't want to be the parents of the world. I don't want to be the police of the world. But when we tell you, leave our embassies alone, and you continue to push forward into our embassies, putting our citizens in danger and our people in danger, yeah, we can't allow that. Because then the next guy behind you is going to do the same thing, thinking he can get away with it, and no one can be under the impression that you're going to be able to get away with messing with the U.S. And Donald Trump sent that message loud and clear and fast. And loud. I'm sure it was loud. I said loud already, but I want to emphasize how loud it must have been. Just boom. Just everything dies. And and frankly, if you mess with us and our embassies, that's precisely how it should be. We're not sending you pallets of cash anymore, guys. You're getting missiles. And if you continue to act the way that you're acting, you'll get more missiles. And we might never actually have to put a troop on the ground. And we could completely devastate your entire country at a bare minimum, your infrastructure, and God forbid we should ever actually go in there and maybe take the oil the way that we should have in Iraq. Um, you know, if if there's any potential benefit from a long-term, you know, war in that situation, not that I'm looking for any, and I, again, wouldn't want one even if you told me that this would definitely be the case, but 
going in and actually taking the oil this time wouldn't be a terrible strategy. And we know that if Trump is to go in there and start a war, which again, I'm not advising and I don't think he actually will, we know from his campaign and from his debates that he, he said over and over again, we didn't take the oil. And, and I see where he's going there. It's that like if you if you leave Iraq, what he was talking about Iraq, and for that matter, Afghanistan with the opium uh, fields that they have out there, like the number two, number one world's producer of opium out there. It's like if you leave these regimes in place, or at least you don't put a a, a powerful enough regime with enough oversight over there, and you leave their infrastructure in place, and you leave the the crops or the oil or whatever it is that's funding all of the chicanery that was going on before you were in there in the first place, it opens the door for all of the same problems that you may have just gotten rid of to just run right back into the area. So again, I, I don't think he's going to war. I don't think he has any reason to go to war. And I'm fairly confident that we will not be going to war short of some sort of massive retaliation from the Iranians that merits it. And even then, I'm not convinced that he's going to put a but you know a, a, a ton of uh, of of foot soldiers on the ground and and do this the way that we tried to do it in Afghanistan and Iraq. I think anybody with two brain cells to rub together can realize that even if you're hell bent on military conflict in that area, that ain't the way to go about it. So I'm I'm expecting no war, and if there is a war, I'm expecting a smarter, more well fought war than any one that we've seen in recent history. Back to uh, back to reality here. Pompeo has made it very clear that the U.S. is committed to de-escalation. That's our Secretary of State, former uh, member, former director of the CIA, Mike Pompeo. Uh, but he he's committed to de-escalation. That's his stance. That's what they're saying publicly. And unless we start seeing, you know, some, some massive amounts of foot soldiers and stuff like that going into the area, there's no real reason to believe otherwise. Because again, he could have just done that to begin with. Could have done it months ago when the Iranians shot down our drone. Could have done it back in Syria at the beginning of his term. Didn't do any of that. Could have rightfully, reasonably could have started a war with Russia to just to tell everybody like, hey, I don't like Putin as much as y'all think I like Putin. I'm going to start a war with Russia or I'm going to start a war with North Korea or I'm going to start a war with China. He's got plenty of countries that he's at odds with has started precisely zero wars three years in looking at another five. Whew, all right. So the, the, the big headline here, what it should have been, is good guy with missile kills bad guy with terror organization. OK, I know that the good guy with a gun scenario really drives the liberals crazy. And if you add a missile into the equation, I'm sure their heads will fucking explode. But that is exactly what happened here. And it's time to all fucking face the facts on this one. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. A good guy with a missile killed a bad guy with a terrorist organization under his under his wing. That's it. I mean, you can nitpick and you can worry and you can speculate and you don't want a war. Cool, I don't want a war either. But let's face it, there's really not a whole hell of a lot any of us can do right now about a potential war. If Donald Trump is going to start a war, he's going to start the war. He's, he's damn sure not going to see Congress's approval, even though he probably should and, and constitutionally has to. Um, but, I mean, like, we get our say in November. If Trump starts a war between now and then, I won't be voting for him. Unless, of course, there's some justifiable reason for it. But, you know, I, I, will I vote for the Democrat? Hell no. I just won't be going to the boat, to the ballot box that day. But that's when we get our say. In the meantime, the media and Congress are going to have their say. But again, I don't think there's any real signs to indicate here that Donald Trump is trying to, to, to thrust us into war in an election year while his economy is doing real good, while unemployment's real low, while he's got everything going for him, even with being impeached. This is like a this is like a no brainer, folks. It doesn't make any sense. And regardless of how dumb you think Donald Trump may be, that the, there's no way that he actually thinks that that could be a good idea. And hey, I, I had another discussion with another friend of mine today. Big, uh, you know, big, uh, big, I guess, war dove. He's not a war hawk. He's a war dove. Not, not, you know, he's very much an isolationist. Doesn't like the military industrial complex. I get it. I'm with you on a lot of respects, man. I, I and I'm the, hopefully you know who I'm talking about out there, but. I'm not playing the speculation game on whether or not there's a war. When the war starts, I will be singing a very different tune. But we've seen instance after instance in this administration of potential wars that could have started. Christ, they were talking about him having the nuclear codes before he even took office, and that was potentially going to start World War III. By the way, we're three years in, and he hasn't nuked anybody yet. So anybody talking about, he's got the nuclear codes, just tell them to sit the fuck down, give them their binky, and then just Put, put on rugrats or whatever it is that will occupy their feeble minds for the next 30 minutes. Whew. 
All right, what else we got here? Um, so I'm reading this whole thing from, obviously, the Time Magazine uh, article that I mentioned and will have in the show notes for you. They used a lot of New York Times quotes, which is sort of interesting to me because I wanted to get back to them about all of this. Was the New York Times trying to warn this terrorist, Qasem Soleimani? Because it seems an awful lot like they were trying to warn this guy that he was about to die at the hands of the U.S. military. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems like treason to me. I, I, I mean, if we had somebody had called Hitler, or if the New York Times had written an article telling Hitler, like we're, we're coming to Berlin, buddy, better be careful. Like that, that, that guy would, that guy should still be in jail. We should keep him alive just to keep him in jail longer. That disgusting son of a bitch, whoever that might have been. But here we are, New York Times, January second. 2020, the morning of the assassination of Qasem Salman. I don't even like the word assassination. When you're when you're the head of a terrorist organization, your death is not an assassination; it's a necessity. Your uh, an assassination is Kennedy, um, Lenin, not Joseph, John. Um, you know, like those are assassinations. Those are prominent figures that somebody went out of their way to kill for virtually no reason. Um, this was not really an assassination so much as it was just something that needed to be done probably a long-ass time ago, but thankfully, it's done now. Getting back into this article here. It's an opinion article written by Stephen Simon, who um, it appears is trying to warn this terrorist of what's about to happen to him. Now, A, if that's true and that could be proven, that is despicable. Two, who the hell is leaking this information if that is true? How the hell did Stephen Simon get his hands on the information if that's what he was doing here? Now, I'm sure you're asking yourself, like, what are you talking about? What, what would even make you suggest something like this? Well, again, the article published on January 2nd, the morning of the airstrike that killed Soleimani, in the article, which talks about the temptation of the use of hypersonic missiles, it reads... <clears throat> and I quote, Moreover, hypersonics are a weaponized moral hazard for states with a taste for intervention because they erase barriers to picking fights. Is an adversary building something that might be a weapons factory? Is there an individual in an unfriendly country who cannot be apprehended? What if the former commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guard, Qasem Soleimani, visited Baghdad for a meeting and you know the address? The temptations to use hypersonic missiles will be many. Hypersonics also push us towards a slippery slope. They blur the line between conventional and strategic weapons in their easy, justifiable use, say, to kill a single terrorist leader in a crowded city. Could make it easier to accept their widespread use with much more destructive consequences. Okay. There are far too many coincidences in this article for this to be a coincidence. I'm sorry. I, I, if Look... Call me a goddamn conspiracy theorist. I will wear a goddamn tinfoil hat around New York City. Okay, like whatever. Doesn't matter to me in the slightest what your opinion of my opinion is here. There are way too many coincidences in just these two paragraphs of this article. And it gets worse. But he mentions Soleimani by name. He says, visiting Baghdad for a meeting and you know the address, the temptation to use hypersonic missiles will be many? Does this... Unless Stephen Simon is a time traveler, there's no explanation for how he could have possibly known that unless it was leaked to him by somebody in the White House. Hypersonics also push us towards a slippery slope. They blur the line between a conventional and strategic weapons and their easy, justifiable use, say, to kill a single terrorist leader in a crowded city. Okay. That, you know what? I No. There's no... There's no possible way this is a coincidence at this point. And to make it worse, let's dive even deeper. Stephen Simon the writer of the article, is part of something known as the Quincy Institute, um, which is actually mentioned in the byline of the article. The Quincy Institute is, according to Wikipedia, a U.S. think tank founded in 2019 and located in Washington, D.C. It promotes, quote, ideas that move U.S. foreign policy away from endless war and towards vigorous diplomacy in the pursuit of international peace, end quote. Okay, based on that, it actually sounds pretty cool and I'd like to join. But, of course... The organization was originally funded by, you guessed it, 
George Soros' Open Society. Now, in fairness, it also happened to have been funded by the Koch Foundation. Gen uh, Charles Koch donated a boatload of money towards trying to open this all up, too. Um, Koch is a more of a, a right-wing, um, you know, I guess financier for a variety of different political adventures. Soros tends to be more left-wing, although he has donated to people on all sides of the political spectrum, particularly earlier on in his career. But the Quincy Institute happens to have an executive vice president by the name of Trita Parsi. Now, Trita, who regularly appears on CNN, was once outed as possibly, I want to stress possibly, lobbying on behalf of the Iranian government. He sued for defamation, and the suit was thrown out because he couldn't provide strong enough evidence that the allegation was without merit. Worth note. Again, that's the Iranian government he was potentially lobbying for. This is a vice president, executive vice president of the Quincy Institute. And he has already, of course, been on TV after the killing of Soleimani talking about how we may already be at war with, an, with Iran right now um, in pure alarmist fashion, as you would expect from everybody on the left today. And some libertarians, too. Like I said, I got some of my friends who are not necessarily, well, one of them in particular is right-leaning. Another one, I guess, is sort of a centrist, if that even exists these days. Um, and, and they were, you know, kind of getting on me about all this. What's your boy doing, man? My boy's doing just fine. Thank you very much. And for those of you unaware, my boy is Donald Trump. All right. So furthermore, getting back to the New York Times, they've got some serious explaining to do. So there's this website called Iran-Daily.com, and it's a pro-Iranian propaganda site. The About Us section on the website is blank, which I thought was a little odd, but the website suggests that it is registered, the domain it is, registered to a man by the name of Mohammed Taghi Rogahani, Haniha? Mohammed Taghi Roganaha. We're going with Roganaha. Mohammed, we're going to refer to him as from henceforth. All right, so Mohammed registers the domain for iran-daily.com, right? And the website is one of many that happens to be owned by the IRNA, the Iranian Republic News Agency. In order to file for the domain name, somebody usually needs to provide a name and a mailing address and a phone number. And strangely, Mr. Roghani, uh, Mr. Muhammad, we're going with Muhammad because I'm sick of botching these names here, provided a telephone number and a mailing address that just so happens to match the telephone number and the mailing address of the New York Times. What the fuck? For real. Um, so you've got an article written by a guy who works for an organization that's supposedly about stopping all these sorts of wars, who happens to have a guy who may have been uh, lobbying on behalf of the Iranian government as one of their executive vice presidents. And then you got this Iran Daily dot uh, com website which is apparently run by the iranian government but the person who registered the domain for it works in the new york times offices again i say unto you what the fuck like what the fuck seriously now i actually wrote an email to muhammad here and we'll see if we get a response if and when i do i most certainly will be sharing it here that'll be my first big breaking news here but i asked him i was like dude you register for this domain name. You work for this website that clearly works for the Iranian government. And why is all of your contact information matching that of the New York Times? We'll see. We'll see if Muhammad has anything to say. But don't ever say your boy is and at least make an attempt to do some journalism. And in this case, your boy is me. So now that I'm done with most of the facts and all that sort of stuff and my opinions on those facts, let's roll into some of the reaction. I wake up this morning and I see the words, Dear Iran, are trending, right? And I know, because I'm just aware like that, that as soon as I click on this link, I'm going to be triggered. And I even know that this was almost definitely some radical leftist apologizing for us killing one of the world's most prominent terrorists. Was I disappointed? No, of course I was not. And that brings us to Rose McGowan. Yeah, that Rose McGowan of ready-to-rumble fame. Yeah, she was Sasha. Anyway, she writes via tweet, because this is obviously the most appropriate way to send these types of situations, these types of sentiments, but neither here nor there. I guess I can't complain too much with our president Twitter thumbs and all that sort of stuff. But from her tweet, at 
Rose McGowan, by the way, R-O-S-E-M-C-G-O-W-A-N. There's a blue check mark and everything, so we know this is her. She says in the tweet, Dear Iran, the USA has disrespected your country, your flag, your people. 52% of us humbly apologize. We want peace with your nation. We are being held hostage by a terrorist regime. We do not know how to escape. Please do not kill us. Hashtag Soleimani. A couple things here before I get to my real official response on all this here. First and foremost, we do want peace with your nation. 48% of us do not want war with your nation, if that's the implication that she's trying to, to spew there. And that's like the least of her oversights in here. We are being held hostage by a terrorist regime. Really? Who's keeping you here, Rose? You got the money. You got the money. You got the funds. Feel free to leave whenever you'd like and take Chelsea Handler and Lena Dunham and whatever that other bitch's name from Charmed is with you. Just go. All of you go. You're not being held hostage by anybody. As a matter of fact, we'd all probably prefer that you left. And we don't know how to escape. I'm sorry, did your royalty checks from Charm stop coming in? Are you incapable of walking to a goddamn airport or driving or Ubering? You don't even have to drive. You can use an app on your phone and someone will pick you up, take you to an airport where you could say, send me literally anywhere but the United States, and they will do that for an appropriate amount of money. You are not being held hostage by a terrorist regime. This is not a terrorist regime. And if you don't know how to escape, that explains how you came to the political views that you came upon. Also, she threw a little gif of, a, of an Iranian flag with a little lion and a sun emoji on, and I'm pretty sure that's not how the flag actually looks, but way to disrespect a country that you're trying to show respect for, even though the fact that you were showing respect for them in the first place is frankly reprehensible. And that brings me to my response. This is how I'm going to send y'all home. Ahem. Dear Iran. Well, actually, let me correct that part. Because there's nothing dear about you. Yo, Iran, Barack Obama is not the president of the United States anymore, regardless of what you read on Twitter. The current president doesn't draw meaningless lines in the sand or blame internet videos for the death of his ambassadors. He sends 100 Marines in an airstrike if you ever think about attacking us. Meanwhile, your country is a galaxy-class shithole. The entirety of your country is like a trip back to the 1600s. You are the fifth largest producer of oil in the world. Take some of that money and fix your mess, rather than worry about our embassies. Leave us, and Israel alone for that matter. We took out one of your leaders on a whim. Imagine what we can do if we really wanted to hurt you. Sit the fuck down and cool your jets. Lastly, and just come to my attention, that Rose McGowan of Charmed fame, much like that other wretched harpy whose name I've forgotten but I'm sure is having an abortion as we speak, have attempted to speak for all Americans. They humbly apologize to you for the glorious act of blowing your general to kingdom come. Speaking of blowing, it's, it's just dawned on me now that perhaps they were not on their knees to grovel, but for other reasons, you know like the ones that got them their jobs in the first place. I would also like to vehemently denounce this apology from Miss McGowan and inform you that these washed-up wenches do not speak for anyone other than their beta male boyfriends and their multitude of cats. But beware, if the third charm cast member resurfaces, it could be the end times, in which case I hope we spend our last precious minutes on this earth making sure that the desolate wasteland you call a nation is turned into a shiny piece of glass before it all comes crashing down and it hurts inside. And yes, that was a Hulk Hogan reference. And yes, just like the Hulkster did to the Iron Sheik, who happened to be from Iran, we're going to hit you with the big boot and the leg drop should you ever think, even for a nanosecond, that it is a good idea to step to the United States of America and the greatest military force ever constructed under the sun. You have five more years of Trump to contend with, and I suggest that you regroup, you lick your wounds, and wait for the next inept, cowardly, despicable Democrat to take office so you can walk all over him or her or Zer, just like you did the last one. Sincerely, Harrison Bergeron, 
and the Right Opinion Podcast right here at the therightopinion.podbean.com, also available on iTunes and Google Play. I don't know if y'all get it over in Iran, but I would appreciate it if you gave it a listen. Anyway, that's it. I think I've, I think I've summed this all up here. Uh, the New York Times potentially in bed with Iran, Rose McGowan, unbearable cunt, and Donald Trump handled this masterfully, as he seems to always do with all of these sorts of foreign policy things. And remember, we've been at potential war since the second the guy took office. Zero wars have started since he took office. I think that's the big takeaway here. We've killed the leader of ISIS. We've killed the leader of the Quds Force in the Iranian uh, you know, Revolutionary Guard over there. We don't go in there and do full-scale wars. We do it the way it should have been done. As a matter of fact, the way it was done back in the day, the CIA, we just sent somebody in, we killed a person who matters, as opposed to killing everybody else and wasting a whole lot of time and money and, you know, spilling a whole lot of blood along the way. Now, Trump has, has not done a lot of this either. It's not to suggest that he's just willy-nilly sending the CIA places to snipe out, folks. We've killed the leader of ISIS and probably the next most prominent terrorist after that leader of ISIS, after actually we killed the top two guys in ISIS, if I'm not mistaken, and then we killed this guy. So three top-notch, world-class terrorists no longer exist because of Donald Trump, and you all should be thanking him for it. And I know, I could, I could feel you cringing right now, like even some of you conservatives who are, you know, anti-Trumpers, If I don't know why you'd be listening to the show, but if you're just looking for a reason, you know, somebody's tuning in like, who's going to spin this positively for Donald Trump? Well, I will tell you anyone with a brain. Anyway, that's it. I'm all done here. Again, the right opinion.podbean.com. Uh, be sure to check me out also on hackerhamin.podbean.com and the Rat Salad Review Network. Uh, both of those are available pretty much anywhere podcasts are found, and the Rat Salad Review is available on YouTube. Um, last but not least, follow me on Twitter at Right Opinion Pod, and you can follow me on Instagram for the same. I've been getting a little bit better with trying to get some of my memes up there. Uh, I'm going to try and get some videos up there, although I got to tell you, I hate Instagram with a fiery burning passion. I wish so badly I could just do everything from my computer, but it appears that I can't always do that because it's really a it's an app designed for your phone. But alas, here I am trying to make it work, and uh, and I'm doing my best. I'm just not doing so great with that. I also got other things on my plate. Got a girlfriend. Got a kid. Got a job. Got other podcasts that I do or that I uh, that I executive produce for. I guess. Um, so, you know, lots going on in the world. But I wanted to make sure that I got. All of this information out to you about, quote unquote, Trump's Benghazi, which was anything but. And I thank you again. And I remind you, as always, that opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one. But this asshole has the right opinion. And you can check it out right back here on Sunday, January 5th, the right opinion dot podbean dot com or just search the right opinion on iTunes or Google Play. Thanks again, guys. I will talk to you next time. Peace.